The pink mare floated in the tube, opened her bright blue eyes. Slowly, as the tank began, a whirling sound, and the blue liquid started to drain away. The cylindrical glass walls slowly sunk into the floor, spilling her out on the floor in front of me as she choked and gasped. I stood in stunned silence as she got to her hooves, her dark pink mane drooping over one of her eyes. I unzipped my barding and threw it over her. She shivered and put it on shakily, giving a light smile. Number f 42, reporting for d d duty. Managing to speak in between her chattering teeth with a soft voice. Number 42. Was she a copy like the ones Pinky mentioned? I reached up and brushed her wet mane from her eye, surprised that the water was quite warm. Do you still feel cold? I asked, while looking around for a towel or something else to cover her with. She shook her head as best she could. N no, the sh 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 shakes will p p pass. She sat down, looking around the room, slightly worried. How l l long? I blinked, dumbly. I didn't know what she meant by that. How long until the shakes wore off? Until we could leave here? What's the y y year? She must have seen the confusion on my face, as I blinked for a moment. Oh, right. I remember the entrance had blurted out the time since Pinky had last been here. Uh, what was it? If you were sealed in the last time Pinky came, it's been about 127 years. Her expression went from one of worry to one of hopelessness. Then it f finally happened, didn't it? The shakes seemed to be subsiding. What happened? You mean... How could you guess that? I sat down in front of her, scratching at the back of my neck. In the event of a mega spell exchange, it was predicted that it would take 70 years for the most of the land to become hospitable again, and close to 50 or 60 more for society to rebuild itself enough to find me. She looked up at me with sad eyes, before meekly adding, And here you are, right on time. I reached up and put a hoof under her chin, returning her gaze with a soft smile. It's not so bad, out here. Lots of good ponies make it through, and have been trying to make a life for themselves and their families. And it seems stables are opening every now and again. So with a little hard work, we can rebuild. We can be better this time. She smiled back and leaned in close. You know, you have my gift for bestowing happiness. And for being one of my relatives, you're pretty cute. Before I could react, she leaned in and gave me a kiss on the lips. I just stared back in shock as she got up and walked past. But, but, I felt like my brain was about to implode. My own great great and so on aunt just kissed me. That was just wrong. I shook my head vigorously to try and jumpstart my thought train again. So, backlash is it? As the new head of the Ministry of Morale, what are your orders? She typed something into the terminal faster than I thought any earth pony could do by moving their hooves. Shall we get started? I finally managed to get to my hooves and trotted over to the terminal. On the screen was a small loading bar, climbing percentage by percent, up to 100. I looked as she gave me a slight smirk. Her now dry mane and tail poofed out as if being inflated by some invisible air pump. You have no idea what this facility is, do you? She nodded for me to follow her, and we slowly walked back through the uh, only door in. Loud sounds came from high above as lights began to illuminate the walls from the wide shaft the elevator traveled in. The round two was incredibly wide and maybe 200 feet across, running what looked like nearly a thousand feet up above us. The lights had reached our level with what looked like a, was now a loud slamming, continuing down another thousand feet or so before stopping. The walls on each level above us started to move, worming back around to a central point, leaving the large spaces in each floor open. As the walls across and below us slid open, I beheld the most awe-inspiring sight I'd ever held. Row upon row of unused tanks, crates of munitions, and silver 
ponytrons sat in perfectly preserved condition. I could see different models of griffin chasers on the lower levels, and mounds upon mounds of yellow and pink Ministry of Peace medical boxes. I felt my jaw hit the floor as I watched level after level open below to reveal more and more pre-war spoils. How has no one found this yet? I looked and gazed as 42 leaned back against the railing, seemingly unoppressed with the massive collection of arms. Pinky space, she said, and she inspected her horf boredly. You know that spell that allows a saddlebag to hold more than its size would normally accommodate? It's just one Pinkie Pie tweaked and amplified. She leaned back onto her hooves and walked back into the room. I followed with an interested ear. In reality, we're only about 50 feet underground. Kinda neat, huh? She pepped up as the terminal refreshed its screen with a beep. Initiate command 66? Yes, no. She beamed a smile at me and threw a hoof around my neck. That's all you, big guy. Only you can give the order. What does it do? I asked as she awkwardly started bouncing, shaking my head along with her. Don't ask me, I just work here. She released her grip, started bouncing around the terminal on all fours. I shrugged and hit Y, then the return key. Okie dokie Loki, please present your personal tag to the screen to continue. I wrote up my chin. Hey, what does it mean by this? She bounced over, jumping in place as she read it, gasping before hopping to the wall, tapping it with her forehoof. A loud clang emanated from the other side, and the section of wall slid open, revealing a set of shelves stocked with an old assortment of bright pink guns. Forty-two leaned over, biting and grabbing a small pink tube that hung in the center, and trotting back with it. It's this, I think. She tweaked her neck sideways, and the pipe split open, showing off the black padding inside. She tossed it into the air effortlessly, and lifted my left hoof up. The tube snapped shut with a click. All of a sudden, my vision filled with scrolling pink code, and displayed a protection, a projection of my current health, weapon, ammo count, clock, and a compass that also showed nearby ponies. That was... interesting. I looked around, walking around the terminal as I got used to the odd sensation in my vision. I smiled and glanced back at 42. A sharp pain filled my eye again. I rubbed it with a hoof. Smile irritation is normal when adapting to a pit buck, but don't tense up, suddenly, or... As if it were a big red button that said do not press, I disregarded what she said and did exactly that. The world around me seemed to slow to a stop. 42 was basked in a pink outline. The bar read 2% pointing at her. I couldn't move and started to panic. Okay, let's think how to cancel this. Whatever it is. And upon thinking of the word cancel, the world started up again. You will... She paused. You activated sats, didn't you? She lowered her gaze to a glare. I nearly giggled at the premise of having my own pip buck. I had seen others who had them before, even sold a few busted ones for a good profit. I pranced in delight around the table before 42 held up a hoof and stopped me. It was one of Pinky's personal spares. You need to use it to start the program. She pointed her hoof over at the screen. I moved around her and held it close to the terminal. A soft clattering came from the pip buck as it seemed to connect. 42 walked over to the wall and pulled off what looked like a pink and blue five-gallon bucket with a short stick on one side of it. Come with me for a moment. I need you to see something. 42 said with an intrigued tone as she walked out through the door again. I shrugged as the chirping stopped and the terminal refreshed. Transfer complete. Have a fun day. As I stepped through the door, as a loud PA system kicked in on the shaft, 42 was standing at the end of the walkway, with a smug face on, the elevator waiting behind her. I noticed that her blip on my compass was now red. Huh? I wonder why I did that. She wasn't... Personnel transfer completed. 
Congratulations, 42, on your promotion to the acting head of Ministry of Morale. I gasped as she stood on her hind legs and leveled the weapon on her shoulder. Without thinking, I dove forward to the floor. The report of the cannon was deafening as it fired, its projectile completely smashing through the terminal and lodging itself in the black back wall. I stared at her in disbelief as she pointed the cannon down to me. You've been so good, I think you've earned yourself a little supervillain monologue. You see, that pink bitch locked me up here to help fix Equestria, because I was the clone she hated the most. She was so sure that it would never come to this, that she locked the one pony away who she knew could be better than her. The walkway groaned. I looked back to see a crank creep across the base of the door. The whole platform listed down an inch or two. 42 let out a loud cackle and stepped back into the floating glass pair, tossing the cannon away before the shield closed her in. I struggled to my hooves and grabbed around the railing as the platform gave out more groans and cracks than I'd care to count. You see, I died 120 years ago, and I survived. I'm better than she ever was. I am the real Pinkie Pie. And when I find the mirror pond again, I shall return with an unending army and reform Equestria and the world as it suits me. She laughed maniacally as the walkway tilted into a nearly vertical angle. I wrapped my foreleg around the railing and held on for dear life. And don't worry, I'll make sure to save you a spot next to my throne for any time you want to drop in. She clapped her hooves joyfully together as the elevator started to rise slowly. Get it? Drop? In? <laughs> well, I've got to fly. Just feel free to hang out here until I get back. Goodbye. The elevator rose up and through a small hole in the ceiling disappeared from sight completely. How many times am I going to end up in situations where I'm faced with imminent death without my friends? I mean, come on. I spoke to myself softly, looking around as the supports cracked and groaned out in protest. I know I'm a bit overweight, but come on! Just hold for a little longer. I promise to go on a diet. Seemingly in response, a sharp pang rang out as one of the two girders snapped from its mounting, slowly rocking the walkway down as the bolts of the final beam squealed in torture. As it swung, I could see the cannon two floors below and it gave me an idea. I started to rock against the railing, the walkway swinging further with each push, chanting softly under my breath. Luna, why am I so stupid? At that, I twisted myself and used the momentum to fly over to the second level down, slamming into the concrete with a jarring thud as the bolt sheared off and dropped the walkway down to the abyss below. As I got my legs under me, I grabbed at the cannon next to me with a hoof. It immediately stuck in line with my leg like a magnet. In the corner of my vision, the pit buck told me the party cannon had one out of... What the hell was that? Some sideways eight? One out of whatever slots loaded. I spotted a silver square on the support beam a few feet away. I trotted up to it and read it was an elevator call panel. I hoofed the button angrily. When I get back up there, I was going to shove this cannon so far up her... The computerized voice from outside interrupted me. Elevator recall authorization. Denied. I hoofed the button again. Authorization. Denied. I mashed the button angrily as fast as I could, because for some reason I thought that would work. Maybe if you attempt 23 more times, I'll give you a clear for a ride. <laughs> I stepped back a few feet, growling and hoisting the cannon up. I screamed as the cannon fired. The large spherical shell ball flew through the support before smashing into and crumpling a tank around it and down the way. The panel hung in the air by a few sparking wires, the button lighting up a soft yellow as a computerized voice stuttered. Authorization accepted! A glass pair dropped down quickly and sat next to the ledge. As I stepped in, I noticed the ammo counter in my vision was counting down from two minutes. I hit the 
button labeled entrance inside as it slowly lifted me up, guiding the tube into the center of the shaft. Docking movements later in front of the large steel door. I raised the cannon to the steel door as it hissed and slid. The cries of my friends called out for me as they ran around the corner and down the stairs. Where is she? I'll kill that cunt! I galloped through the shield, using the party cannon to push past my friends into an empty street. No alicorns, no deranged pink clone. I looked around as I could feel nothing but rage. A hoof pressed on my shoulder, spinning around, stuffing the obscenely large barrel against Skyline's head. Her sad eyes staring into mine with an intensity I had never seen before. She put her other hoof around my neck, and I felt the anger melt away. I sat back onto my haunches with a plop. The cannon dropped to the ground with a clack as I returned the hug, tears welling up in my eyes. She laughed softly and kissed my cheek. Oh, Celestia, was it good to see your face again. She wiped the tears from her eyes and let me go. Brass trotted over and pulled his helmet off, staring at my foreleg. I see you got yourself a pit buck. Brass spoke softly. Skyline stepped back and looked down, her eyes lighting up as she saw the pink computer strapped to my leg. I looked over to see Carlotta picking up the party cannon and looking it over. And some decent artillery, if that's what this is. She smiled, the first genuine smile I'd seen out of her, and handing it back to me. Friend, you've got to stop saving my life. It looks bad on the reports I'm sending back. I laughed and wrapped a hoof around her neck. Welcome to our fucked up family. I smiled as she cringed and forced herself to keep the grin she had. Brass poked my shoulder and pointed across the street towards the ministry hub. Dude, where's your car? 42, you're a bitch. After our quick reunion, I explained what had happened and how 42 was planning to overrun Equestria with an army of herself. I instructed Skyline to fly back home with Carlotta, grab some supplies and a pair of saddlebags for me, and meet back at Ten Pony Tower. She looked worried about leaving me again, but nodded and took off with our friendly er friendlier. She still looked like she could kill me with one claw tied up. Griffin in tow. Braz and I galloped along the ruined streets, making good time. I had the party cannon stuck to my back. Don't ask me how. It just stuck. Like a magnet. Pretty sure I said that before. And my pit buck set to the fastest route back. But it turns out that the map of Manhattan was pre-war and didn't like to tell us when entire buildings lay in the way. But it was understandable, and most of the time we could go down a few blocks and get around it. The sun was once again setting as Brass and I charged our way across the open field towards Ten Pony security checkpoint. I looked up and spotted movement to see Carlotta and Skye flying ahead of us, dropping down and waiting at the front of the guard post for us. As Brass and I slowed to a canter, then a trot, the fatigue hit. We started dragging our hooves as we walked up to meet them, the sweat running off me in buckets. I could hear Brass heaving along with me through his helmet. You know, I take it back. You really aren't at all, all that out of shape. Skyline said with a giggle. Brass and I collapsed to our sides, breathing with heavy gasps. Yeah, Carlotta blurted out as she poked Brass's helmet with a claw. Maybe they're just lazy instead. I was too exhausted to take a swing at her, so I thought about it in my head. I pictured my hoof slamming into her smug beak in slow motion, and watching as she apologized, forever making fun of my obvious greatness. Yeah. It felt so damn good. We going to be here all night, ladies. She barked in annoyance. Brass and I slowly climbed to our hooves. He removed his helmet and levitated alongside us as we walked up to the gate. Please remove all weapons, ammunition, explosives, contraband, illegal substances, and all around dangerous items and deposit them here in the tub. You may collect your belongings when you leave the tower. I don't know if I was tired, or if he was bored because the guards seemed to drone on and on. Everyone removed what they had as I remembered the party cannon on my back and went to remove it. The guard 
raised an eyebrow at me. Sir, your pink bucket does not count as a weapon, but if you like, I could keep it so the other residents won't laugh at you. I... F uh, he finished with a grin. I grumbled and contemplated showing him just how dangerous my bucket was, but decided that getting inside was a bit more important. I followed the others into a spacious shopping complex, admiring the busy bustling of dozens of ponies as they went about their business. We need to speak to DJ Pwn3. I spoke up, drawing looks from several ponies as they passed. Any ideas where to find him? I asked the group. For many times as I visited the tower, not once had I seen the mysterious radio stallion. My ear twitched and got my attention right before the ding of an elevator door chimed across the plaza. An off-white unicorn stallion with a near neon blue mane stepped out and was immediately surrounded by several excited foals. Can we get your autograph, Mr. DJ? One of the colts uh, called up. They bounced with glee when he levitated out a pen and started signing their papers. I glanced and shrugged to my compatriots. Well, that was easier than I expected. We walked over to him as the children ran off with their newfound prizes in their mouths. DJ Pwn3 looked us down eyeing us over the brim of his dark glasses as we surrounded him. Let me guess. You guys aren't here for an autograph, are you? He said in the smooth voice I had always loved hearing over the radio. I tried to keep it straight face, but failed as I let out a squeal and danced excitedly a bit. I was standing right next to the biggest celebrity in the Wastelands. Well, technically the only celebrity in the Wastelands, but still. Ah, oh, Celestia, do I look alright? Shit, say something before you look like a moron! Yes, er, no, er, I mean, I have urgent news about the wasteland. Can you sign my pit buck? Yeah, in no way does he think I'm some sort of crazed pony who will someday talk, uh, stalk him relentlessly and murder him in my basement to skin off his coat and parade around in. Smooth work, backlash. I thought sarcastically as I gave a nervous smile and shoved my pink computer nearly into his face. He groaned and turned to walk away. He eyed the device curiously before pushing it away. News can be left in a note form upstairs with my assistant, and I'm fairly busy right now, so if you'd kindly... He stopped just short of walking into Carlotta, looking up at her, his face twitching in annoyance. Can you please step aside? No. The griffin's blunt answer made him cringe in anger. Not until you hear him out. Story of the century material. He eased up slightly at those words. Still angry, though. He turned abruptly and walked back over to me. I beamed out happily and raised my pip buck again. You have thirty seconds. If your news is any good, I'll consider hearing you out. He sat back, furrowing his brow in obvious annoyance. I lowered my hoof slowly, giving him the saddest eyes I could manage. And I'll sign your pip buck, but only if the news is any good. I grinned and nodded eagerly, clearing my throat. My name's Backlash. I'm a trader from the outskirts. I found a pre-war bunker next to the Ministry of Morale hub, and as a descendant of Pinkie Pie, it let me in. Inside I found DJ Pwn3 stuffed a hoof in my mouth. You're related to a Ministry mayor. I nodded slowly as he looked around for a moment in panic. Come up to my room in an hour. We will talk then. We can't talk here. It's not safe. He popped his hoof out and called down the elevator. I wiped the drool from around my muzzle and gazed at him in bewilderment as the elevator doors closed and he rode away. So, who's hungry? Brass said as we all shrugged. But, my pit buck. I said sadly, as the group turned and walked away. We took some much needed time to eat at one of the local restaurants. I scarfed down two full orders of cram and some cooked bloat sprite meat as the others enjoyed their meals. When we left here, I didn't know when we would have a chance to fill up on food again, so I made sure to get more than I needed. Also, screw those support beams from before. They didn't hold up their end of the deal, so why should I? As the hour limit approached, we went up to the elevator, 
to the top floor marked M-A-S E-B-S. We walked uh, into a round foyer with a large statue in the center. DJ Pwn3 was sitting next to it, raising his hooves as we approached. He levitated off his glasses and put them in his barding, eyeing us with his crimson-colored eyes before leading us into the next room. It turned out to be some sort of library. Shelves upon shelves upon shelves filled with books lined the walls. Piles of dusty tombs littered the floor and tables as we walked into a set of couches and chairs in the middle of the room. We all took our seats, and over the next hour I began to explain the last few days. The dreams, the note, and the craziness of the bunker. My companions were silent as they listened along with him, only giving the affirmative nod or grunt to confirm the details of my story. He didn't say or ask much, mostly nodded and righted things on the notepad he was levitating nearby. So, this, 42, where is she now? He remarked as I reached the end of my tale. He shifted uneasily in his chair and looked a bit exhausted, as if, as were we all. I think the last time I got a good deep sleep was back at the garage two days ago. And as my body had remained, reminded me constantly, unconsciousness from injury is not sleep. I began to miss that large, stiff mattress on the cold floor, and I bet if I listened hard enough, I could hear it calling to me. But I couldn't rest yet. There was still too much to do. I don't know, but she has my car. Hell, she could have reached Hoofington by now if she really wanted to. But that's why I need your help. I need you to put a word out to every pony that she's dangerous and must be stopped at all costs. The safety of the wasteland depends on it. The DJ got to his hooves and levitated his sunglasses on as he looked out over his notes. The sudden stabbing pain in my eye returned. Wasn't it supposed to be getting used to this stupid display yet? Now, I'm not going to say that I don't believe you, but all this is extremely elaborate of a story, and you'll understand if I have my reservations about authenticity. I can't just broadcast this out and send the whole of the waste into a mass of panic. Now can I? <clears throat> he brought a hoof to his chest. I will keep a watchful eye out for any of uh, those collaborating your story, but until I... He was cut short by a gray unicorn mare with a flowing black mane, throwing the door open and cantering through with a look of both pity and sadness, her tears dripping to the floor as she wobbled uneasily. Love, you must come right away. You need to see this. It's... She sh uh, stuttered and kneeled on the floor. Why? Celestia, why? She whispered before approaching uh, to faint completely. DJ Pwn3 burst up from his chair and quickly enveloped her in her magic before she hit the ground, straining. He floated her over and laid her on his seat, brushing the long mane from her face as he looked over her. Contented, he gave her a kiss on the cheek. I'm sorry, but I must see what she was talking about. Please stay here and watch over my wife, uh, Contra. Again, I'm sorry about this. He brisk, uh, briskly trotted out of the room as I exchanged confused looks with the others. My eyes spiked in pain again, and I rubbed it furiously growling as I turned to the door. Fuck this. I'll be right back. Stay here, I said as I headed for the door. But he just... Skyline started to say before stopping herself, a long sigh escaping her muzzle as she looked at the floor. It doesn't matter what I say, you'll still go anyway. She crossed her hooves and turned her muzzle up to me. It's because you never listen to what I tell you. Like, you don't want me around anymore, or finally think you don't need me at all. I stiffened and stared down the hall. I did feel sorry for leaving her all the time recently, but I didn't have time for this. I knew this emergency had to do with 42. I felt it in my very soul. I turned and galloped down the hall after the DJ. Fine! Maybe I'll just leave forever instead! I could hear Sky scream, with notes of sadness filling her words. I know I promised to never leave her behind, but this was just too important not to attend to. I pushed those thoughts through the back of my mind, and continued running. I found the big doors to the broadcast room and burst through them. 
I was met with hundreds of pictures cycling the walls filled with monitors, each one showing different black and white live images of the wasteland. The room seemed cramped as all the images bore down into the chair at the center most oppressively. A small microphone was suspended by a metal arm hanging over a panel of knobs and switches on what looked to be the center console. DJ Pwn3 was sitting in disbelief, biting his lower lip as he watched a few of the lower screens intently. I recognized a small city that was displayed that seemed to lay in ruins, some of the houses on fire as smoke drifted by the camera. I had made plenty of trade runs there over the years. Dead ponies littered the streets as a single figure walked through the carnage. She was approaching a stallion who was bound and on his knees, her poofy mane bobbling in the wind as she walked up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. She turned to the camera, looking straight into it while smiling and waving. 42. I said softly, grinding my teeth as she pointed the gun at the camera and replaced the image with static. She just took out Ponyville, he said slowly, his eyes a mix of rage and sorrow. She just killed a community full of innocent ponies. She didn't even spare the foals. He put his hoof to his chest and breathed in heavy wheezes. Dear Celestia, she can't have taken them all out. There must be survivors who had time to hide. There must be. He pushed and spun his chair, whipping him around to face me as I let, out, uh, let my hoof smack loudly across his face. I won't lie, it felt damn good as he let out a whimper and held a hoof to it. I let the rage pouring through my veins guide my words. See that? She thinks this is just a game. She wants you to be afraid. She wants you to stay up here and lock yourself in this tower. But you know what? I say she has just declared war on the wasteland. I say you put out a call to arms to every community this station can reach. Tell them what she did there today. Make sure they know about every stallion, mare, and foal she cut down. We need to let 42 know that the wasteland isn't afraid of her, and that we will stand up against her. You need to tell them, no matter how bad it hurts. I finished, as I could see him relax in front of me. His watering eyes replaced shock and sadness with hatred and rage. The light of purpose filling his gaze as he turned and hit the button on the console. The red light sitting above the monitor labeled broadcast lit up brightly. Good morning, Wastelanders. I'm sorry to interrupt the music, but I have urgent news. He spoke into the mic in a low tone. Today, a horrible tragedy has occurred. I am deeply saddened to report to you all that of this morning, Ponyville is no more. The population was decimated at the hooves of a single mare. She is described to look like the ministry mayor Pinkie Pie and is considered extremely dangerous. If you don't know who that is, she looks like that bright faced pink pony from all the posters and billboards. His voice was calm and collected as he continued, not once wavering from the strong voice that the wasteland had come to know him for. Don't let that look fool you. If you see this mare, do not approach her. Do not attempt to reason with her. Report anything you see and stay out of sight until she leaves. The best thing you can do for the wasteland is observe and report. I will bring you updates of the situation as I get them. This is your radio friend, DJ Pwn3, signing off. Reminding you all to stay safe, my little ponies. He clacked the broadcast button again, and the red light shut off. We returned to the book-filled room to find the others sitting pretty much where we had left them. Contra had been moved to the couch and had an old quilt laid over her. Brightly colored apple embroidery seemed to adorn almost every inch. She looked over us weakly, seeming to have recovered a bit. DJ Pwn3 went over and hugged her, his tears streaming down his cheeks. The others looked at me for news. 
It was her. She wiped out Ponyville. She killed every pony. Skyne and Brass both gasped. Carlotta just grumbled. Celestia, no. All those ponies! Sky started to tremble and hugged Brass tightly, sobbing into his neck. That's not possible. One mayor can't slaughter an entire town, especially not Ponyville. You need a small army, or... The slam of DJ Poem 3's hoof on the floor drew a momentary look of shock across her face. She's not just any mayor. She's a Celestia damned ministry mayor. DJ Poem 3 growled out over his wife. You know, one of the mayors that helped defeat Nightmare Moon and Discord? We can't go up against that. No. She's not. DJ Pone 3 got up slowly and turned as I spoke, growling out the words as I hated even the thought of the comparison. She may look like it, but that isn't the Ministry Mayor from the old world. She is some sort of twisted imitation that crawled out of the wrong damn hole and just walked her way into our damned wasteland. Yeah, she looks tough, but that's my fault she got out there, and it's my job to stop her and send her back to the hell she belongs in. Finally, something to spice up this job. Carlotta smirked and nodded, walking over to me and standing next to me. As both your bodyguard and a new friend, you have my life and my guns. DJ Pwn3 nodded as he recollected himself. Then you're going to need full access to the tower's resources. If you're going to go chasing after her, I'll get you cleared for whatever you need. You know that I would never leave my best friend behind. Skyline sniffed and trotted to me, throwing her hooves around my neck and embracing me warmly, softly whispering into my ear. Don't you think this lets you off the hook? We're talking about things later. She pulled me tightly into her and raised her voice with a chuckle. Besides, you need someone covering your flank. Who knows what'll, what you'll do when your stupid plan fails. We all turned and looked to Brass as he just stared down at the floor, his voice faltering. I don't really have anything to offer. I slowly walked to him, putting a hoof on his shoulder firmly. I could see how scared he was and how deep down he wanted to run back to the home he knew and lock the doors forever. Hell, I wanted to do the same thing. But to stop 42, I needed him. Not just his guns or armor, but I needed him to remind me that without the fear and regret, we fall into the harsh will of the wastes. To help us strive to overcome our challenges and to make positive changes, I needed him because he was the living reminder of every pony's innocence in this blasted hell of a life. And that, I cannot fail to stop, 42. As much as we both didn't want to go, I needed the strength of his friendship, if I had any chance at success. All I need is your friendship, Brass. I've learned over the last few days that it's the most valuable treasure in all the wasteland, and that I'm lucky to have it. A wide smile drew across my face as he saluted me stiffly. Just tell me how to jump, and I'll do it. He responded with a chuckle. I looked around confidently at the group of friends before me. Then, we need to get supplies gathered up, and rest up. We have a long way to go, to, And she has one hell of a head start. Brass and Carlotta, you guys see what you can do about finding us some transportation. <laughs> Don't worry. I know just the mare. Carlotta cooed as she left with Brass on her heels. I'll arrange for you to use the Celestia suite during your stay. A gentle voice came from behind. I glanced to see Contra get off the couch slowly. DJ Pwn3 shifted against her, steadying her legs as she got up. You need to rest, dear, he said as she wobbled. You shouldn't exert yourself so much. Remember, you and our filly need to be in good health. He stroked her side softly with his hoof. I won't just sit here and do nothing, as that monster threatens us all. It's not much, but it's all I can do. She snapped back. 
It's more than enough, though. I grinned, and turned to leave Sky hovering next to me. You and I? We need to pay a visit to the good doctor. When we left DJ Poem 3, it was just past midnight, and all the shops closed, we decided to put off gathering supplies until morning. We were shown to a large set of open rooms with ornate furniture and paintings that were all in surprisingly good condition. There was a room off to the side with a large two-pony bed that my body told me was made from a slice of heaven, as well as a connected bathroom with a large tub filled with steaming hot water. We thanked Contra again as she left us to rest and locked the door. Sky disappeared without a word into the bathroom, shutting the door as Carlotta walked past us and into the bedroom. Sorry, boys. Us girls get to bed tonight. I can give you a cap, so you can go flip for whoever gets the couch. But otherwise, good night. She said with a smile and shut us out. I stood with brass in an uneasy silence. So, want to start a fire? He said as I groaned, sitting by the window and staring out, wondering what 42's next move was, and how exactly I was going to stop her from making it. I felt a breeze run through my mane as I looked up into the wide blue sky, the sun seemingly hanging with the clouds as they floated peacefully. My ears perked up as I heard music play softly off in the distance. I got to my hooves and walked over from the tree I was under to the tall grass towards it. The upbeat notes of an accordion played and grew louder as I crested a familiar knoll. Let's party! The jubilant pink filly jumped up to greet my eyes as the invisible confetti cannon boomed, showering me, uh, the table, and familiar guests with red and white strips of paper. You did it! I did what now? I asked, watching her as she drew in a large breath. He didn't know what to do as he saw the mire in blue, so he went with his gut and sealed her shut, never to do the evil that only she knew. The invisible accordion playing along as she sang out her short jingle, bouncing around the table with an absurd amount of energy. I didn't seal her in. I let her out. I winced as I spoke, listening as the music sputtered to a stop and the bright filly stood still in the middle of the table. Her bright blue eyes sadly looked up at me, tearing up. But how could you do that? She said with a sniff. Don't you know she's bad and must have hurt every pony? I watched as her mane went completely flat and her coat darkened. I heard the far-off boom of thunder as the sun was blocked out by ominous black clouds. What have you done? She started to cry softly onto the table. I didn't know what to do. She tricked me into helping her out, I said, filling with regret as I walked slowly down the grassy hill sitting next to her as her tears formed a small pool in the plate under her. I'll understand if you hate me now. I must be the worst relative ever. I stared at her as I wiped the tears forming in my own eyes. I don't hate you, she said as she kicked the plate in front of her. I should have dealt with her a long time ago. I should have never gotten you involved. I still want to help. I've seen what she can do. I need to stop her before she can override the overrun the wasteland. I brushed my mane from her eyes and gave her a soft smile. And I need you to be strong for me, okay? We can't let sadness keep us down, can we? As members of the Pie family, it's our job to spread happiness, right? How can we if we are penned up in a prison of tears? She hasn't won yet, so we still have a chance to save her pony, right? She nodded her head softly. Good. Now, what do you say you and I try and figure out how to beat this mean old copy? Sound good, Aunt Pinky? She nodded and giggled softly, wiping her eyes with a napkin. But it's time for you to go now. She got to her hooves, her mane poofing back up slightly. Come back and see me soon. I smiled and watched as she jumped forward, knocking me back into the darkness yet again as I knew now more than ever, I needed to stop 42. Not just for the wastes, but for Pinkie Pie as well. I awoke slowly, 
stretching out along the floor painfully as my sore muscles screamed out for a few more hours. The rug next to the fireplace wasn't as uncomfortable as the dirt road, but it was nowhere near as comfortable as the mattress the girls had, or even the couch for that matter. But I was just happy to get some sleep after the last few days. Brass and Carlotta were absent as I looked around, and the light outside was more rain drizzled down. The ruins of the city seemed to loom amongst the dark gray sky more than usual. I headed to the beth a bedroom to find Skye preening her feathers silently, not even looking up as I strode into the, the bathroom. I took a short shower to help me wake up and clear my thoughts for the day ahead. She seemed to be back in a bad mood, and was waiting by the door when I came out, so I assumed she was ready to go. I stuck the party can on my back and walked with her to the elevator. As we rode down, she hit the emergency stop button suddenly. A small ring sounded out as the car, the car stopped with a sharp jolt, making me wobble into the wall. It's time we had a talk. She bore down on me imposingly as she hovered silently, her hoof jutting out to press against my nose. You think you can just keep running off, trying to play the hero? Do you even stop to think what that might uh, meant putting me through? You know how bad I felt when you were in the infirmary? I nearly lost it when you were down on the street. But when you traded your life for Carlotta's? I couldn't do anything. I just sat and cried. Brass carried me the rest of the damn way because I didn't want to move anymore. I sat and listened. I owed her that much. No, I owed her everything. We've known each other for most of our lives. I can't imagine I'd survive out there even a single day without her by my side. I know she must have felt the same way. Sometimes I hated my overly overt brain. As she lectured me, I could see every ounce of emotion, hear the truth behind every word. But I brought this upon myself, and I needed to hear it all. I swear to Luna, if you ever go running off trying to play hero without me again, I will personally break both your hind legs and lock you to the radiator at home. She angrily punched the emergency stop button again, the elevator resuming our ride down with a beep. I didn't know what to say. She was right. But with 42 out there, if it came down to it, I don't care what I promised, or how much she screamed. I would trade my life for skies in a heartbeat. She landed softly beside me as the floors uh, ticked down to one, not even glancing over. Her face locked in an emotionless staring match with the door. I leapt onto her suddenly, hugging her tightly around the neck. All we have ever had is each other. There's nothing in the wasteland that could let any pony keep me from you. I don't want you to leave. Like you tried to tell me, you're all I have. And I'm sorry for everything. The elevator dinged as it stopped, and the door slid open behind me. I want you to be by my side until the day I die. I love you. I felt the sky relax a bit and rub my mane. I fucking knew it! Brass's voice caught me off guard. I jumped and spun around to see him armorless and standing outside the elevator with Carlotta, who was now reeling on the floor in hysterical laughter. <laughs> you told me no! She's like a sister to me! But then you pull this! Why can't you just be straight with me? Sky and I stepped out of the elevator car, Sky trotting up and poking at Carlotta as the griffin struggled to breathe through her laughs. I thought we agreed to never speak of that again. I jabbed a hoof in his chest, staring into his gold eyes with such intensity I had hoped he was going to catch fire. Well, you were the one who said you didn't love her when I... He was cut short as Skyline threw him to the side with what seemed like incredible ease. Trying to get to me, yes, I suddenly knew how it felt to want to be lit on fire by the same gaze. You said what? She screamed out in unbridled anger. I told him you weren't my lover. His sick mind thought we were together. I spoke with a shudder, pointing a hoof to Brass as he got back up, hoping she would settle for reading the shit out of him instead of me. I watched in relief as she turned her eyes unnervingly towards Brass, 
tensing for a moment, before moving to dive at him in a furious attempt to mercilessly beat him to death. In that fraction of a second, Carlotta was holding her back, effortlessly by, effortlessly by the tail, as she flailed her hooves a half a foot from the young stallion. If it's any constellation, I totally thought that as well, Carlotta said before leaning in closer to Sky's ear. That is, before we got to spend some quality time together. Sky blushed in deep crimson that showed through her red coat and dropped back to the ground. Ah! She trotted towards the infirmary in frustration, yelling out again as she rounded the corner and disappeared into the plaza. Am I interrupting anything? Dr. Fitz stepped out of the elevator as the doors slid open. I came down right away when I heard you needed something urgently. Is Skylant injured? He looked around before starting to trot towards the clinic. I quickly turned and followed, leaving Brass and Carlotta in the hallway. We walked into the small medical center briskly. I noted that none of the shops were open, and there wasn't a pony in sight. Skyline coasted over and joined my side with a huff as Dr. Fitz entered his office in the back room. I've been told to give you anything you need and not ask why, but I'll have you know that unless it's for a good cause, I won't give you a single healing potion more than you ever uh, to you ever again when we are through. You'll be clearing most of my stock for weeks as is, but with this lockdown in reaction to Ponyville, I don't expect any grievous injuries to occur anytime soon. He fidgeted with a key and opened a small cupboard, revealing sets of assorted supplies. Skyline scooped everything into her saddlebags and stepped aside. Hold on, you're taking all of it? He jumped back and slammed his hoof on his desk. This is outrageous. I don't care what the big stallion upstairs said. What gives you the right to clean me out? Skyline grabbed him by his lab coat and pulled him off the ground, leaning in close. He squirmed and looked around nervously. You know that bitch who took out Ponyville? He nodded slowly with a soft whine. We're going after her. You can whine and complain all you want, but the fact is, we're going to need all the help we can get to stop her before she does it again. Got it? Skyline huffed in anger as she dropped him. He straightened up his coat and trotted over to a gray locker in the corner, opening it to reveal another stash of supplies. Then you might as well take these. Just promise me, if you find anyone still alive in Ponyville, that you'll use these to help them. He spoke softly, sighing, and walking back to his desk, sitting down and looking over some papers. Don't worry, Doc. You have my word. I put my hoof to my chest and nodded slowly. Carlotta poked her head around the corner. Hey, our ride's here. Come on, you two. I got a pre-war bitch to find. The rain slicked across the rooftop landing pad in sheets as the wind whipped around wildly. A gray sky car uh, sat parked on the open. Its sides were brightly painted yellow lettering scrolled across, reading absolutely everything. Ditsy Doo had apparently lent us the cart at Carlotta's request. I should have expected that I would have to accept help from a number one trader in the waste at one time or another. She was every trader pony's top competition, always knowing where to find all the good stuff before anyone else could get their hooves on it. But I guess that comes with being around from before the war. She offers her supplies and delivery services to every pony from here to Hoofington at prices few can even compete with. Hell, I'd have to give things away for free if I wanted to beat her out. Carlotta led us to the side door of the silver car before walking around to the front hooking herself onto it. I hesitantly followed Brass as his power armor squealed through the door frame barely, taking a seat next to our exit just in case we had to get out fast. Did I mention how much I hate flying? I looked outside as Skyline stretched her wings and took off, circling around us before dropping back to the pad next to the soaked griffin. I shut the door, sitting down across from Brass as he levitated and looked over his helmet. There was a knock on the side of the car before the door swung open again. DJ Poem 3 leaned his head in. I wanted to give you this before you go. It's a relic from my younger years and his explorer. He levitated over a green flak vest.
The steel plates sewn in seemed lighter than others I had come across in my journeys. I looked up in confusion, and he seemed to nod in response. They used some sort of rare element in the alloy, making the steel extremely tough. But don't expect it to stop everything. I unzipped one of the pouches, a square piece of black steel with rainbow sheen glinted in the light. Closing it back up, I smiled back to him, kicking off my saddlebags and setting the party cannon down, pulling the vest on tight. I couldn't get it around to fasten under my chest. The vest flaps were too small. Stop thinking I have a weight problem. This isn't... what it is. But otherwise it fits snugly. As I shucked my saddlebags back on, Carlotta yelled back at us through the missing front window. You ready to go, ladies? Anyone need to use the bathroom? Because once we're going, we aren't stopping until we hit Ponyville. Brass and I shook our heads, and DJ Pwn3 shut the hatch before appearing outside the window next to me. Just listen for any updates on your Pitbuck radio. I'll put the word out if I find anything relevant. Uh, good luck, and may Luna guide you. He called out, his words growing softer as the sky car lifted off immediately lurching to the side as we banked around the tower. I flopped over against brass, suddenly remarking how I now wanted to avoid flying anywhere with someone in power armor. I scrambled to the front window, the rain and wind pelting my face. Do you mind circling around the MOM bunker? I need to see something. My voice strained to cut through the noise of the weather. Carlotta looked back and gave a nod. Sure, but it'll add another hour to our time. She yelled back. We'll really be pushing the spark battery limit. I nodded back before sliding against the side as she banged hard again. Brass clanked into the wall as even he lost his footing. This was going to be a long trip. I tried to pass the time by looking over the party cannon. It didn't seem to have any moving parts and was completely empty inside. The barrel, even when my pipbook said it was loaded. Yeah. Before you say it, I know I have a really bad weapon muzzle discipline. It's my first gun for crying out loud. The pip buck readout showed it as still having a good amount of durability left in it, but I wouldn't know how to fix it even if I needed to. Hell, I don't think I could be fixed. I just hope we wouldn't absolutely need it once it was inoperable. So what is that thing? Brass called over through the speaker in his helmet. The sheer volume of it easily cut through the wind and the rain. I don't know why, but he still had the helmet on. I almost couldn't be sure if it was brass tacks in there. I wish I knew if that was how they intended to design the armor's look. Regardless, it unnerved the hell out of me. Beats me. Pinkie Pie made it, so I doubt she fully understands it herself. I flipped it around on my hooves. I mean, it's obviously a large boar cannon. But how it loads itself, or knows when I want to fire it, is a mystery to me. I tried to toss it to him, hoping it would stick to him so he could understand what I meant. It didn't. It bounced off his armored hooves and clacked to the ground. I shrugged and picked it back up again. Still not used to the feeling of suction as it stuck to my hide. I'll let you see when you're out of the suit again. Yeah. Okay. He spoke back with a disappointment note to his words. Too bad they don't come in anything but pink. What a loved one uh, to bring back to the base. I thought about that for a moment, actually glad I didn't see any others down in the bunker. I can only imagine how imposing a couple of these strapped to power armor would be, let alone the damage they could do. Also, I'm pretty sure if it was in gunmetal gray or black, every pony would want it as a weapon. Pink allowed me to get it in unnoticed. Well, unnoticed as a weapon. <clears throat> Skyline caught my attention as she tapped the side of the uh, sky car, notifying us that we were under the ministry hub. I looked over at the window as we banked around for a wide pass, scouring the ruins for anything standing out. A flash caught my eye as I saw a purple alicorn teleport to the roof of a short building spreading her wings before taking off towards us. I yelled to Carlotta and Skyline. Don't shoot! Alicorn incoming! Both the flyers looked back to me, like I just told them to trust 42. You're joking! What do you mean don't shoot? 
Skyline yelled as she drifted away from the car, lining up to intercept the flying monstrosity. Trust me, I need to talk to her. I yelled back, throwing the hatch open and leaning out, hoping the insanely strong Olicorn would see me and think not to blow us out of the sky with her magic. But then I looked down, which was a bad idea. The ruined cityscape zipped by at high speeds as my hooves trembled, slipping from their grips as the sky cart banked again, dumping me out into the air. Skyline yelled out as I fell. I looked around in panic, seemingly plummeting to my doom. The alicorn streaked into a dive, coming up next to me as we raced to the ground. Grab on! The goddess's voice boomed inside my head. I never thought I'd say this, but thank Celestia for the mutated flying freaks. I hooked my legs around her neck as she pulled herself back into a level flight, racing left and right around fallen structures as we gained altitude. She seemed to beat her wings effortlessly as we caught up to the sky car. I jumped off her back and onto the roof of the silver car as she came close enough, grabbing the luggage railing as Carlotta pulled it through the air. The goddess demands the book as you promised. Her voice echoed in my mind as I clung on for dear life. We're heading to Ponyville. Meet us there and we can talk then. I screamed at the back uh, uh, of a strong wind that made it hard to keep my eyes open. You are just trying to escape my sight again. I shall accompany you until you tell the great and powerful goddess the secrets she wishes to know. Your choice. I tried to give a small smile as, it, as the rain poured over me. It's only another few hours to Ponyville, I told myself. Another few hours of freezing my flank off on top of a platform, moving quite fast a thousand feet above the solid ground. I'll be fine. I hope. The rest of the trip was silent, minus the howls of the wind and the incessant taps of rain that poured over the sky car. We were all on edge, I more literally than anything, with our alicorn escort. But she stayed a good length away from us as we flew. The rain had stopped a few minutes ago, and now shivering, uh, as we began our descent into Ponyville. The bodies of dead ponies lay in the muddy street, silent and still, the only reminder that it had once been a busy town. The car touched down uh, and drew to a stop. I flopped over the side and landed in the mud loudly. I was glad to be on the ground again. I groaned and tried to get to my hooves, which just didn't want to cooperate. So instead I flopped to my side and laid there, staring up at the sky as the large purple form of an olicor, an escort, towered into my vision. You have arrived! Now give us the book! She put a hoof to my side, pressing me down into the mud, pinning me. Brass came out of the cart, his minigun whirling up to speed. Foles, the goddess grows tired of your interference! A pink shield encompassed around the olicor, and I, as the gun clattered and shot a short burst, the round slapping the shield uneasily, failing to penetrate. Where is the book? My brain started to hurt and throb as her voice seemed to reach into my darkest recesses. It wasn't there, I said, getting a mouthful of mud as I squirmed under her hoof. You lie! You cannot fool the great and powerful goddess! She pushed down on me harder. I started to sink into the thick mud. The records told me where it could be. I have a list. You can still find it. I coughed into the mud, the pressure lifting off of me as she thought about it for a moment. Give us the locations. No, I replied. She growled and pressed sharply into my side. We guarantee, what guarantee do I have that you won't kill us if I tell you? I spoke quickly, my muzzle struggling to stay above the mud as she pressed me in deeper. The goddess makes no such promises. You will have completed your task and will be dealt with as we deem sit fit. I thought quickly, searching my mind for anything I could use. Shit. I needed something. Wait, that's it. What if you need me again? To get through another door? I cried out, gasping one last breath before my head sunk under the wall of wet dirt. I felt her hoof come off me and took the moment to throw myself out of the pit gasping for air between her legs as she stood there, completely rigid. This is an acceptable agreement. You will now tell us the locations of the book. I panted hard and tried to wipe my muzzle clean. 
only managing to get mud further uh, because of how bad I was shivering. It was reported to have been in either the OIA hub or the Hightower prison in Hoofington, or the Ministry of Image hub in Canterlot. And that's all I know. A blinding flash uh, lit up in front of me, as the goddess seemed satisfied enough for the moment, leaving us all sitting by ourselves in the middle of the quiet street, with nothing but the wind and the bodies of dozens of murdered ponies for company. I tried to stand up again. My muscles screamed and my hooves failed to find anything solid, slipping me back down. I guess I'll lay here until I die. Pros of laying. I don't have to do work. Cons. I'll freeze to death. And worst of all, 42 wins. Brass came over and hoisted me up with one hoof, using his helmet to slide me down his neck onto his back. Huzzah! I'm saved. New pros. I can still be lazy here. New cons. I'm still freezing, and I'm staring at Brass's ass. With that, I couldn't help but feel the mud might have been a better option. Carlotta unhooked herself and walked over with a smirk. We need to get you next to a fire before searching for survivors. I gave her my best frigid, snarky retort. What's this? Did our bloodthirsty mercenary finally grow a heart for helping innocent ponies? I glared back, and she glared back unamused. No. I simply want to ask them which way our pink friend went. That's all. The tone in her voice made me let me know that she wasn't even slightly joking, which actually left me a little disappointed. My ears perked up and as the wind picked up. A soft cry emanated from it as it moaned past. Someone's still alive here, I said, pointing down the street to where I thought I heard the voice from. I think they're that way. I'll see if I can spot them from the air, Skyline said as she bolted up and into the air. Brass turned and followed at a trot, which is uncomfortable because he smacked my chin on his ass with each step. We trotted down another street, trying to keep in line with Skyline as it grew loud enough for them to hear it as well. Suddenly, I noticed Brass turn and head into what seemed to be a house. The muffled crying was coming from the second floor as I was tipped onto a nearby couch flopping out of the cushions where I felt like I had never wanted to get up again. They felt so good on my body. I wanted to go back and tell my mattress I'd left it for this beautiful sofa. I'll be right back, Skyline said softly as she climbed the stairs slowly, hoof by hoof. Once at the top, she disappeared from view. Hello? I could hear her call out. Stay back! The shrill voice of a foal called. I have a gun! It's okay. We're not here to hurt you. Sky's voice was soft and kind. Don't come near me! The voice screamed with an agonizingly high pitch. When Daddy gets back, he'll... He'll be really mean to you. Shh. Shh. It's okay, little one. I... Sky's voice was cut short by the reverberating sound of a single gunshot, followed by a loud thump. Shit! Sky! I screamed out and climbed to my hooves finding the strength to nearly fly up the stairs past the others to where she was. I turned the corner to where the conversation was, slumming into a doorway with a wet thud. I looked in to find Skye sitting with a dark green pegasus filly, uh, curled in her arms and sobbing loudly. A large sniper rifle lay on the floor next to them. My daddy's not coming back. Daddy's not coming. The filly repeated between sobs. Skye stroked the filly's white mane, as she rocked back and forth, her face positively glowing as she sat there and looked like a loving mother. It's okay, dear. We won't let anything happen to you. The filly's sobs seemed to drift away as she opened her jade eyes and looked up. What's your name, little one? My name's Pellet Jack. I'm going to grow up and move stuff like Daddy. Will you help me find him? She said as she fluttered her wings. Her crying fit seemed over with. See, this is why I couldn't stand foals. Crying one moment, then breaking the 2,000 cap moisture evaporator you had stored in your cart the next, while laughing in delight. Completely unpredictable, and an accident waiting to happen. I'll bundle up in something that eats your food and won't shut up. Sure thing. But first, I want you to meet my best friend, 
Backlash. She pointed her hoof at me, and I couldn't help but force a smile. Even as much as I hated foals, I still had to be nice. I felt something was off as I wobbled for a moment. Oh yeah, adrenaline gone. Time to fall over again. I crashed to the floor with a grunt and blinked as I saw stars flying around my head. Pallet giggled softly in disguised chest. I like him. He's funny, she said, as she hopped into the air, fluttering her wings again before moving over to me. Sky let out a soft laugh. Yeah, he certainly is. She got up and stretched out her wings, uh, scooping up the rifle and tucked the gun underneath it as she walked over. I saw Pellet Jack hop around in much the same fashion as Philly Pinky did in my dreams. And that changed when she immediately froze, wide-eyed and stiff. Ah! A monster! She dove and latched onto Sky's leg. I felt Brass step heavily up behind me. Brass, stop scaring the foal and take off your helmet. It's not like anyone's going to shoot you in here. Celestia forbid that being a bad thing, though. Carlotta stepped next to him and smacked his face with her tail as he levitated the helmet away. As she stood over me, the heat she gave off was absolutely divine, as my freezing hide finally seemed to stop shivering so much. Pallet turned around and stared wide-eyed as the griffin stood over me. Whoa! Are you a real griffin? The filly bounced around in excitement as Carlotta nodded. Griffins are the best flyers! I want to grow up to be just like you, tearing apart your enemies with your claws and beak. Rar! She jumped up into the air before doing her best to imitate what she had just described. Yep, a hundred percent badass griffin here. Galata spoke with boundless pride. But ponies can be great flyers as well, Pallet. Don't you want to grow up to be just like Rainbow Dash? Sky said with a hint of jealousy in her voice. No, she doesn't. She wants to be cool like all griffins are. Besides, Rainbow Dash could only fly fast. She couldn't stand up to a fair fight. Carlotta cooed back, with more than just a hint of arrogance. Oh, Luna, don't let them do this now. Rainbow Dash took on a squad of ten griffins in the war single-hoofedly, and came out without a scratch, I'll have you know, Sky said, tipping her muzzle into the air and closing her eyes, doing her best to act haughty. This wasn't going to end well. <laughs> yeah, wearing power armor. I bet she couldn't take even one of us on without it. I could see Carlotta's claws digging into the floorboards as the polite conversation started to degrade into verbal trench warfare. Besides, didn't she abandon her duties? I've never seen a griffin do that. Fuck trench warfare. Carlotta just dropped a fucking Celestia damned mega spell on Sky. I went to call out before Skyline and her ripped each other to bloody ribbons in front of the already scared filly. I was surprised to hear her squeaky voice pipe up first. Why can't I be cool like both? I want to be a rainbow griffin. She bounced between them with a look of utter glee on her face as Sky and Carlotta froze, their angry glares cracking slowly before they burst into laughter. I didn't quite get what was so funny about it, but maybe that wasn't just an inside joke to all flyers or something. My brain hurt. Actually, a lot of me hurt. Uh, guys, can one of you make a fire? Kind of frozen to the floor here. As I warmed up by the fire next to an armorless brass, Carlotta was running around the house with a screaming filly perched on her head. Skyline had gone back to bring the cart to us. As I was a quick sweep for the other survivors, I'm keeping an eye out for the body of the stallion who Pallet described as her father. I really hoped he was alive somewhere. It was hard on Sky and I losing our parents, and the only reason we made it was because we had each other. Well, Sky didn't lose hers, she just hadn't seen them since leaving. I can't imagine having to grow up alone in the wasteland. I shook at the thought out of my head, seeming to knock Brass out of his own as well. Did you just ask if I liked you? He turned to me, speaking with his cheeks flushed. Um, no, I didn't. I raised my eyebrows at him slowly. Oh, I'm sorry, what did you ask? He said as he hid his head into his hooves. His golden coat was glowing as red as skies. 
I didn't say anything. Is there something you want to talk about? I said with a relaxed smirk. The most insidious ideas filling my head. Being as he was already off guard, there was no reason I couldn't have a little fun at his expense. Right. He sank down to the floor and quivered. N no it was just a stupid thought, he said shyly, between his hooves. It's just that I do kind of like you. I smiled as seductively as he spoke, leaning in close. He was making this far too easy. Well, how about you and I go somewhere quiet, and what did Carlotta say it like? I leaned to his ear as threatening as I uh, to change his whole coat red. Spend some quality time together? I whispered softly into his ear, giving the tip a little lick as I drew away slowly. Brash shuddered before flopping over with a deep sigh, seemingly in shock on the floor. You know, personally, it doesn't matter to me if it's a mare or stallion. Fun is fun. But you're a bit young, Brass. Grow up for a few years and see what you really like, then. I smiled and got up, stretching out my legs as my body was finally relaxed and warm. The front door swung open and a muddy skyline trampled in. She shook the mud off her coat vigorously, coating everything in the room with it. Myself and the still-in-shock brass included. Sky eyed him curiously before gazing back at me. Wow, you finally snapped and murdered him. I applaud you on lasting this long. Hey, Carlotta, I owe you 50 caps. She yelled to the other room as she trotted over the couch, slicking some of the mud she flung off a cushion with her hoof. Sitting and laying back, Carlotta came running in, panting heavily as the green filly bounced on her ruffled head feathers. How do you ponies do so much moving around on your legs? It's exhausting, she said, as she finally collapsed in the middle of the room, Pallet still ruffling her blue head feathers as she giggled. How do you land a sky car so easily? I can't maneuver worth two bits strapped into that thing, Sky said, rubbing her head slightly with her muddy forehoof. How the hell do you stay warm? while flying, I asked, as I wiped the mud I got hit with from my muzzle. How could you three be so insensitive? Brass joined in as he raised a hoof in the air, still flat on the floor. We all sat still for a moment, trading looks before we all started to laugh hysterically. I know it was only a few nights before, but it felt good to laugh in front of a fire next to the ponies, and Griffin, I now considered my friends. I knew that these moments would grow to be few and far between as we tried to stop 42. But I didn't want to think about that now. I wanted to enjoy the time we had. So we giggled and poked fun at each other as the darkness spread outside. Finally, as the fire died down, we decided it was best to rest up and wait for morning to come. I slept through the night again without any dreams. Not quite sure of whether that was a good thing or not. I yawned and stretched out my hooves. Getting up slowly, I looked around to find everyone else was still asleep. The bright sun turned the horizon a brilliant shade of red. I slowly got up and walked to the front door, going to open it, but freezing, st uh, still to look back at Skyline, soundly asleep on the couch. I know I said I wouldn't leave her, but I was just going to take a short walk and look around. I'll be back in ten minutes. Max. I crept off the front porch and headed past the muddied sky car. Looking at it gave me a small chuckle and reassured myself that the Marauder was the right choice of transportation. Oh, right. The Marauder. Why did 42 have to take my baby? I worked so hard to find half the parts for her. If she so much as put one more dent in my girl, I'll... A glint on the street caught my eye as my wrist pinched up. I squinted so I could see a large lone sprite bot floating along, seemingly inspecting the bodies. Why was it so quiet? Normally those things are blaring bad music, and you can hear them from a mile away. Maybe its speaker had degraded or was damaged. Regardless, I bet I could get some good caps for it if I could shut it down. 
The small sphere turned and seemed to peer right at me before drifting down the alleyway. I smirked and galloped down the street after it. Easy money, I thought, as I turned and ran smack dab into a brick wall five feet in. Didn't they ever regulate where they put random walls before the war? I said to myself, shaking off the pain. I turned around to see the bot floating behind me, staring at me as if sizing me up. Hello there. A digitalized voice emanated from the exposed speaker. I cringed and pressed back against the wall, pointing my hoof at it. Y you can talk? I gave a slight shudder in fear. I had never seen one that was intelligent. Maybe I had become self-aware after the war and was going on an existential rampage to kill all ponies, starting with me. Yes, my name's Watcher. It's nice to meet you, Mr... It just seemed to float there as it appeared to want to make conversation with me. I pondered this for a moment, relaxing a bit. I still didn't trust it. It wasn't going to vaporize me into a glowing pile of ashes the moment I looked away, so I uneasily lowered my hoof and raised my eyebrows to it. Backlash. Um, nice weather we're having? Oh, Celestia, don't make dumb small talk with a sentient and potentially murderous robot. Ah, oh, Luna, I'm going to die. Why couldn't I have just woken up sky like I knew I should have? Um, I guess? Well, Backlash, it was nice to meet you. The sprite bot bobbed away and started to turn, starting to float down the street. And that was that. I had escaped the murderous gaze of the terrifying metal death machine. I relaxed and slid down the wall. Wait, that was it? Wait, what are you doing here? I asked as I peeked my head out of the alleyway. The bot seemed to stop and bob in place for a moment before turning around. I'm looking for the signs of what group did all this. You wouldn't have to know, would you? The digitalized voice sounded somewhat sad. Was it even possible for robots to feel sad? Oh wait, what did it ask? Right. I did, I said as I looked down. Well, not me personally. But I'm the reason it all happened. You wouldn't believe me I told you anyway. The metallic sprite seemed to hang in silence. Try me. I've seen lots of unexplainable things in my time. It said as, it's, as I slowly walked out in front of it, sitting down. I drew in a large breath and paused for a moment. I opened some large pre-war bunker in Manhattan that freed a copy of one of the Ministry Mayors, and now the copy is on a rampage across the wasteland to look for a place to make even more copies so that she can take over the world and rule as a tyrannical dictator. I gasped as I finished the explanation in one go. For some reason, I felt that was impressive. I... see. The bot sounded neutral again. I knew it was a bad idea. That pricked my ear. What did it mean by that? Look, I'm almost out of time, but I'll keep an eye on you. If you want to talk, just see if you can find another bot like this one. Understand? I shook my head in confusion. Out of time? What in Celestia's name was going on here? Before I could ask, there was a sharp crackle of static as the bot began to blare one of its annoying, upbeat marching songs and floated away down the street. Looking back the other direction towards the sky car, I saw a skyline fly out. A look of rage etched on her face, the sunlight making her look like a piece of red-hot metal, contemplating the hellish vitches that was the wind which blew with her white and yellow striped mane behind her, looking something akin to an open flame. Hey, morning, sunshine, I said as I cantered over to her, putting on my best forced smile. I just got back from taking a leak. Totally didn't abandon you like I said I would. I wouldn't, and go talk to some creepy robot voice. Nope, nothing like that at all, I explained, with as much nervous guilt in my voice as I could muster, hoping she would take it as a joke. She squinted and reached down, boobing my nose with her hoof. Whatever. I'm watching you, mister. She stated slowly as she hovered back towards the porch, sitting on the edge as she craned her neck, letting in some letting some vertebrae prop pop. Any news from DJ Pwn3? I stared blankly at her. You know, on the radio? I blinked again, 
and raised an eyebrow. You forgot your Pippa has a radio, didn't you? She finally sighed out and plopped onto her back. I totally did forget. I fumbled with my pip buck and switched it on. The smooth voice of the familiar unicorn filled the air. To keep the rat away, children. You don't want to mutate into one of those scary ghouls, now do you? But now it's time for some news. A good bit of news is the army of alicorns plaguing the wastes has seemingly turned its focus elsewhere. So you're free to come out of your hidey holes for a while and breathe the fresh wasteland air. Maybe the goddess decided to send her hordes to Hoofington and Canterlot. Hopefully for good. If they can get into either place, they deserve that stupid book. Who knows where they went off to, or how long they'll be gone. So it may be best to not take a too big of a breath. With the Canterlot ghouls uh, didn't get you, the pink mist will melt you into whatever it is around and make you a permanent part of the scenery for the rest of time. And Hoofington? That place is just one death trap after another. Even if you make it past the centuries and uh, evisceration, nobody gets to his core. I've met plenty of other merchants who thought it would, they would be the first in. I've never met a trader who told me how he got out. As for our mysterious pink impersonator, I've been getting reports of a pre-war car driving along the outskirts of the Everfree Forest to the west, with a driver matching the description of the wanted mare. Where she's headed is a mystery to all of us, but that's all for the news. Before I go, I'd like to tell my little ponies about a group of them out there who's attempted to track her down and bring her to justice. If you see a ragtag group supporting, uh, sporting a griffin in a traveling sky car, then please, lend them whatever help you can. Even so much as a box of cram, or a single bullet will help. We need all to come together to help bring this malicious pink mare down. I smiled and clicked the radio off. We have a direction, and we might have the good ponies of the wasteland supporting us. I'm coming for you. 42. Level up. Plus ten big guns, plus five speech. New perk, extremophile. You seem to like being set on fire and frozen so much you feel right at home in it. You take half the normal damage and fatigue from the elements. Fire, cold, electrical, and chemical. You would normally get. 